So welcome everybody. Thank you for attending today's session. Uh, my name is Danny Diaz. I'm going to be one of your moderators today. Kyle Oldham is one of our other moderators today. So if you have any tech issues or otherwise, please let us know. Um, but just to jump right in. Um, first, I'm going to be presenting Katie Deiter. She uses she, her pronouns, and she is the Director of Advising in the Human Development and Family Studies, HDFS. Um, department. Katie Deiter has implemented and coordinated peer mentoring programs at CSU since 2011. Her interest in mentoring programs as an effective approach to supporting student success, particularly among historically marginalized student populations, has been informed through her 20 plus years working in student affairs. Katie is interested in continuing to learn best practices and mentoring while collaborating with students and colleagues engaged in similar work. So thank you, Katie. And then next we have Lucy Falto Bravi. She, her is her pronouns. Um, Lucy serves as an academic success coordinator in the HDFS um, department and coordinates the HDFS peer mentoring program. Lucy joined the HDFS program, our department, excuse me, in December of 2018, after 10 years of working with federally funded TRIO student support services programs at the University of Northern Colorado and Colorado State University. Her personal passion and professional interests are focused on educational access, student success, and retention of marginalized student populations. In addition to Lucy and Katie, there will also be a panel of students that are currently mentors and mentees in the program, Desi, Perla, and Jeff. Well, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Danny. Um, Katie, did you want to go ahead and share? Great. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you for those um, introductions. And we're so excited that you're choosing to spend um, part of your day, which for many of you is probably uh, your lunch break um, with us uh, today to um, engage in some uh, information sharing um, and idea generation around um, uh, peer mentoring programs for undergraduate students from marginalized identities. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, the title of our presentation is From Creation to Collaboration, Departmental Undergraduate Peer Mentoring Programs. Um, Katie, would you mind advancing to the next slide? Great. So um, during our time together today, we have a couple of objectives um, that we're hoping you'll be able to walk away with some information about. So the first is just kind of sharing a little bit about the value of peer mentoring programs. Um, there are a lot of different uh, models of peer mentoring um, and types of peer mentoring programs that exist on our campus. And so we want to kind of ground um, our presentation in why um, coordinate and implement peer mentoring programs. Um, we'll also share a little bit about our specific program that we've created um, and are implementing in the Human Development and Family Studies Department. Um, we're going to allow for some time for folks to share best practices um, and for us to kind of talk with each other about where we're at and where we see ourselves going um, in terms of mentoring programs in our individual departments and um, as a campus. Um, and then also allowing for us to kind of talk through some next steps of what do we do after this? How do we put this into practice in our, um, in our departments? Uh, so I just want to make sure we um, are able to kind of talk through virtual expectations and community agreements. Um, we've been, uh, I think we all have become more familiar with um, uh, how to um, appropriately engage in virtual settings, but um, so we're all on the same page. Um, please mute if not speaking. We absolutely want to allow for this to be an interactive um, experience. And so we certainly want you to ask questions um, and um, engage. Uh, and we also wanna make sure um, that we're minimizing any background noise and distractions. Um, I have a dog who gets a little barky sometimes. So I know that happens for folks. Um, so please mute if you're not speaking. Um, if you haven't already, um, 
uh, please add your name to the Zoom information and your um, pronouns if you choose to do so. Um, if, you need, if you need to turn your video off, that's totally fine. I know we all have different kinds of bandwidth depending on where we're at. So um, if you need to do that, uh, totally understand and um, feel free to participate um, through audio or chat, um, whatever ways you're able to. Uh, feel free to speak up, raise your hand and use the chat functions. Um, we know that folks have a lot of um, knowledge that they can bring to this conversation as well. So we definitely want you to feel um, like you're able to contribute to this conversation today. Um, when we're in small groups, which we will be, we are gonna do some breakout rooms um, throughout our session today. And um, so we expect uh, that you're able to um, uh, carry these expectations and agreements with you into our breakout rooms. Be present, open, honest, and authentic. Um, speak from personal experience using um, I statements to share your thoughts and feelings. Listen actively and respectfully. Be open to new and different perspectives. Um, remain respect and maintain confidentiality and find your learning edge, that, that, that space where we're getting a little bit outside of our comfort zone. Let's go there today so we can grow a little bit. So like I said, we're gonna start off with just kind of grounding our presentation in what peer mentoring is and, and why, why peer mentoring matters. Um, so uh, just to kind of have a operational definition of peer mentoring, we're, we're typically talking about peer mentoring that takes place between um, uh, an individual who's lived through a specific experience. Um, for us in this context, we're talking about um, the undergraduate student experience. So mentors being students who have, um, who have transitioned into college or are um, currently college going students um, and um, mentee, um, someone who's new to that experience. Um, so uh, a more experienced junior or senior class standing student serving in a role as a mentor, um, uh, supporting a mentee, typically um, an incoming first year student. Um, peer mentors are typically close uh, to their age and uh, in age to their mentees. And again, there are some varying um, types of mentoring that exist. Um, it's something that folks might be familiar with is kind of a, a big brothers, big sisters model of mentoring, which pairs a, an older adult with a, with a, with a youth. Um, or the Campus Connections Mentoring Program here on campus that pairs um, college age students with um, youth in Northern Colorado. But peer mentoring is really mentoring um, peer to peer in folks who are in relatively close age to each other. Um, peer mentoring often takes place, but doesn't have to um, always, but it often takes place in an edu educational setting. Um, however, the focus isn't um, on academics necessarily, but rather relationship and other topics um, that might be uh, uh, playing a role in an academic experience. Um, something that's really important for us is to make sure that there is a distinction between um, uh, mentorship and advising. And so in our program model, we definitely do a lot of um, uh, training and development around what mentoring is, is not, um, and when students should be seeking out um, guidance from their advisor versus a mentor. The value of uh, undergraduate peer mentoring, again, I think we've all, um, we can all pr probably call on experiences in our own lives when um, we've had someone um, uh, be willing to serve as a mentor to us and the impact of what that mentoring experience was. Um, and so we also just wanted to kind of ground our presentation and some research around what the value of undergraduate peer mentoring programs is. Um, particularly for historically underrepresented students. And so there, um, this, a lot of this research was actually, and Katie's gonna talk about this in a few slides, but we had um, submitted a proposal um, to uh, initially get funding to start our peer mentoring program. And so a lot of this research and literature comes from that initial proposal that was submitted. Um, 
So there's definitely strong evidence and research that mentoring is a highly effective strategy um, to improve outcomes for um, all college students, but specifically from um, historically underrepresented um, student populations, primarily low income um, student backgrounds or first generation student backgrounds. Um, and this is primarily because uh, students from marginalized identities um, have unique experiences that create opportunity for um, uh, mentorship to be a really effective strategy. Um, uh, there's some research that first generation and students from um, ethnic uh, and racially minoritized backgrounds are more likely to feel alienated from their peers, particularly at, a, at an institution um, that is a predominantly um, white institution. Um, and the feeling of alienation can sometimes lead to disconnection, not only in terms of community, but in terms of academics. Um, so sometimes having that mentor is able to provide connection, community, um, and therefore allowing for students to um, perform better academically. Um, it also offers different levels of integration, right? Like integration within um, uh, the academic department, as well as connection to other um, offices or programs on campus. Um, and again, having that kind of support system or web of support can oftentimes um, increase uh, student success and retention. The other immense value of peer mentoring is that oftentimes, um, you know, you can start and run a peer mentoring program with really limited um, resources. Um, and the benefit can be pretty significant for students who are participating in it. Awesome. Um, so we also wanted to share a little bit about the diversity um, of the HDFS department. And this was part of our why of why we wanted to create a mentoring program specifically for first generation um, college students and students of color within our department. Um, uh, Human Development and Family Studies is, is situated in the College of Health and Human Sciences. Um, we're one of the largest majors at CSU. I think we have over um, a thousand undergraduate students in our major. Um, and within uh, our undergraduate student population, 34% of our students identify um, as first generation college students. Uh, and the definition that we utilize um, for first generation is uh, neither parent having earned a bachelor's degree. Um, so 34% of our student population identifies as being first generation. And then 31% of our students identify um, as coming from a racially or ethnically um, diverse background. So um, we're one of the largest majors and we're also um, a very diverse major um, here on campus. Um, so that was part of our why in terms of why we wanted to create um, a mentoring program. In terms of our um, uh, students who identified as coming from um, racially or ethnically diverse backgrounds, um, the majority of our students uh, identify as coming from a Hispanic or Latinx background. Um, and you can kind of see in um, the the numbers on the right, um, the, there, we are still a predominantly white major, right? Like I think our the diversity within our major is kind of reflective of campus overall. Um, but this for us really highlighted a need uh, to create a community of support for students who come from um, racially or ethnically diverse backgrounds. We wanted to have a space where students felt like they could identify with faculty, staff, students who have backgrounds similar to themselves, um, not only in certain spaces on campus in, a, in an SDPS office or um, in, in certain spaces on campus, but also felt like they were able to make those identity-based connections in their academic department as well. Great. Um, so thanks, Lucy. I'm Katie Ditter, um, and I am the other presenter with Lucy for this session. 
Um, so we are going to um, now switch to talking about our program, our peer mentoring program in HDFS specifically. And this program was started in 2018. So I'm just going to kind of walk you through how we got started. Um, and then uh, we'll transition to where we are today. Um, so just kind of looking at how we got started. So we initially, I joined the HDFS department in 2017. And um, at that time, we were talking about creating or implementing and creating a, a mentoring program in HDFS. We didn't really have a time frame with that, but it was something that was definitely discussed. Um, then that February, um, HDFS was selected um, to be part of the SSI2, actually that should say SSI2 um, initiatives, which were to decrease um, graduation and retention gaps that existed on campus between um, students uh, from marginalized, historically marginalized backgrounds and um, those who are not. Um, that really kind of fast tracked our peer mentoring program. And so um, HDFS was selected to be part of this uh, small group due to our high graduation rates that were already um, you know, in place or happening. Um, and retention rates uh, and along with, like Lucy said, diversity within our major. So those components really allowed us to be part of this um, uh, SSI2 initiative. And with that were faculty members and myself as the director of undergraduate advising um, who came together to really think about what, what we wanted to put forward as our project in HDFS to look at um, improving our numbers. So because the mentoring program had been talked about this earlier, that was selected for um, the departmental action teams, they were called. And so our team of faculty um, and myself and our department head came together to put forward the peer mentoring program as our uh, project for this initiative. And for the reasons Lucy just talked through, um, we identified first-generation students and students of color to be part of our program. So again, there was, it was just a really, um, it was a pretty intense time period from those initial discussions to when we were trying to get this program off the ground and in place starting that fall of 2018. And so in March and April, we started to conduct fo focus groups, excuse me, um, in the major, to connect with our students and kind of generate interest. And so um, I'll share with you kind of what those look like here. Whoops, coordination is, okay. So, um, so like I said, our aim was to address the existing graduation and retention gaps uh, for these particular students by providing additional support through the mentoring program that would be um, applying a high um, impact practice. So the focus groups were conducted for two reasons. One, to better, better understand our students' experiences at CSU and within our department, and to assess their interest in being part of the program. So again, we identified um, students uh, who identify as first-generation students and um, students of color who had 2.75 cumulative GPAs or higher. And we had, um, we shared, information with faculty and advisors and asked them to identify any potential leaders within the major that who we could then reach out to. And that was done primarily through email um, as well as some, some promotional flyers, but primarily through email. So this, we thought we, it might be helpful to share some of our materials that we use during this process. So this is the email that was sent to those students and in terms of the number of students, there were over there were over a hundred students that this information was sent to, um, uh, or right around that number. It, it might have been a little bit lower, actually. Sorry, I was thinking of our total students um, who would who would be part of that um, those student groups. But those with the two point seven five or higher it would be a little bit smaller group. But it was still a large number of students in our major. Um, and again, just sharing with them that we were going to pilot this program. Um, for the next academic year. And we wanted to know if they would be interested in um, being part of a discussion um, to help us with our development of the program. Whoops, again, 
coordination. Okay, so again, sharing the questions. These were the questions that were part of our focus groups. And we ended up with um, another faculty member and I conducted the focus groups. Um, and we had probably 20 students who responded that they wanted to be part of the focus groups. Of those, we had um, 10 to 12 students who were part of those actual focus groups who actually attended. And these were the questions that guided those um, discussions. But what happened, so just to break these down a little bit. So like, you know, like I'd mentioned earlier, we really wanted to see what was their experience. We really wanted to hear from them first about their experience at the university and in the department. Um, and then we wanted to find out what their ideas were around structuring a program. And so, um, you know, questions about a time commitment and, um, and uh, participation and activities. Uh, were some of the questions that we asked. And then finally, if they would be interested in being part of a program like this uh, in terms of piloting it for the fall. And what happened is we, we, we pulled some of these questions, but really the conversations were just so rich and so engaging. And the students, as many of you know, who are involved with these types of programs, just so impressive and articulate to talk to um, about this that um, the questions sort of naturally just unfolded um, in the process. And um, we just walked away with a lot of really um, valuable information. And so I'll go through the results from these focus groups um, with the next few slides. So um, number one, the students overwhelmingly um, talked about an interest in being part of um, the focus groups as um, their desire to help other students, right, through the process, help other students navigate it um, in a way that might help them uh, differently than, than the students we were interviewing maybe felt support. Um, specifically, students talked about um, how difficult it is to transition to college. And I think these quotes were just really two of many, you know, that students shared about how difficult it really is navigating um, all the different aspects of this transition from college to family to academics, um, and then um, making connections. And that peer, um, having a peer to help them would be, um, would be definitely something they were interested in. And then the, the peer advising role specifically, you know, coming from students who had this experience, again, was a, um, a major reason for students um, in terms of what they thought would be helpful with these groups. Oops. So again, this is one of the um, comments from students about that transition um, and how difficult it can be. So no one talks about how difficult the transition is, making friends, feeling lonely, how difficult classes are. I wish someone would have said their first semester was tough and this is how they got through it, making connections early on, just having a friendly face in class. So these types of things from students saying this would make a difference to me really helped us um, move forward with the program. It really provided great um, testimonials and also helped us share this with our mentors who we were gonna be training um, to be um, role models and mentors to their, to their first year students. In terms of things that help students, again, during our focus groups, these are some things that students mentioned that were helpful during that first year. Um, RAM welcome, summer orientation, and having older friends who had previously attended CSU were, were factors that they found helpful. What they said would have been helpful, um, you know, that's that first quote that I just mentioned, um, having a friendly face, just knowing someone on campus that they could reach out to. Um, more guidance in terms of making decisions um, and making those that balance between financial health, um, academic and finance and um, family stress, and just kind of making connections with resources on campus to help um, with those decision with that decision making. And then really getting that support early on, right? Once even before classes started, um, having many of them talked about wanting to be able to have a friendly, uh, face or connection so that that would kind of give them some security in making that transition to campus. Gosh. 
gosh darn, you'd think I get that. Um, and again, similar to the reasons for wanting to be part of the focus groups, um, students cited the opportunity to give back and help another student like them as reasons they would be interested in participating in the mentoring program. And so, gosh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I lost my clicker. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I'm so sorry. Okay. Wow. Well, that was way. I found it, I guess. Okay. So here we go. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Here's where we're trying to be. Okay. Um, so the other thing we really wanted to know was if they were going to be part of this program, then we wanted to know what they wanted the program to look like. We didn't want to just sort of create this cookie cutter program from previous experiences we had had, either with creating programs or in being part of the programs. And so interestingly, um, students were really split in terms of our questions about, like, should they meet with their mentor or mentee a number of times during the month, or should be based on the hours uh, of, um, of a month that they would connect. So, you know, two to five hours a month, or should it be like, you know, two to four meetings? And so, you know, people that was pretty split in terms of their interest. Um, they were very much interested in balancing structure um, with a program that met at least, you know, once a month with flexibility to do things outside that program meeting. And they loved the idea of making connections with other groups in HDFS and across campus. And so, and, and many of them were already part of those groups. So that was something that they were interested in continuing with and partnering our program with some of those resources that already existed um, on campus. All of the students said that they were interested in being part of the program. Um, and again, the reason being that they wanted to be able to give back and help another first year student. So this is the program timeline um, in terms of from that first pilot program that started in 2018 and 19, um, that academic year. So although all 10 to 12 students who were part of our focus group said they wanted to be part of the program, in terms of schedules or other obligations, we ended up with six mentors that year and then six mentees for a total program cohort of 12 students in that first pilot program. Um, and again, um, that program was really structured based on students' feedback from the focus groups. So we met once a month with the students. Um, we, they, we selected a, a day of the week and time, and we stuck, that, stuck with that through the semester. Um, meetings were, I believe, about an hour and a half um, each month. And we met with the students to talk about some of those topics. And we had some in mind that we wanted to include. And then we had students meet outside of that uh, once a month meeting with their mentee and mentor. Um, and we really left that up to them in terms of the number of times and the hours. Um, we, we left that flexible, but we used mentor logs and, um, and um, oral reports to kind of check in with students to see how those were going. Um, let me just double check. So that was really that first year. Um, and then in the second year, um, the program um, grew. So 2019 to 2020, um, we, the pro program grew to 24 students. So we basically doubled the size of the program. So 12 mentors, 12 mentees, um, and a lot of really great things came in um, and came in to be included in that program. One of them was that Lucy had joined the um, advising team in December of that year. And so it was really important to us that we were not only including um, an academic advisor, but also a faculty member. So a faculty member, academic advisor, and myself kind of overseeing the program was really the, the program um, administration. And through that, we were able to bring uh, the larger cohort together in 2019, 2020. Um, we also introduced course credit for the um, a course and credit for that course into the mentoring program. And that really came out of, for those of you who are engaged in programs, you know, we are interested to hear your experiences. For us, what we found was that it was very difficult on our students to try to meet outside of 
our once a month meeting time, even though it seems like that would be plenty of time with students work schedules, academic schedules, family commitments, and leadership positions, they were just really stretched. And I think even with good intentions, it was really difficult to match up two different um, schedules to have, you know, the significance of meetings that we were hoping to have. So we um, put together a course um, outline uh, and submitted that to the curriculum committee in the college. And then we were given the opportunity to have a pilot course that year of 2019, 2020. And a little bit further in our presentation, we'll share some of the topics that have been part of our, co um, our courses um, since this time. The other thing that was really significant and some of our students here today will be able to talk about it, but we also introduced um, a retreat at the beginning of the program. And we were able to go um, up in the mountains for an overnight retreat. And again, the funding that we received from the departmental action team allowed us to um, integrate this type of um, an opportunity for our students. So we went up to um, a Buckingham camp and um, did an overnight retreat with students there with their staff. And that included ropes courses and bonding activities and those types of things. Then in 2020, at the end of that year, our plan was to have an end of the semester uh, um, a banquet sort of a recognition event um, at the LSC um, to really honor the experiences and, um, and uh, the program uh, and our students as, as part of that. Um, but as we know, then in March of 2020, uh, COVID hit. And so we took the program virtual and we met with our students virtually um, once a week. The, the course also met once a week, excuse me. We'll talk a little bit more about that here a, a little bit further along, but the course met once a week. So when we moved online, we went virtual um, and then we were not able to kind of have the end of the year recognition event like we had hoped. So this is kind of the start of some challenges um, that we really faced with the mentoring program. Um, and, um, and so in 2021, um, that was really evident. It was a really difficult time to not only recruit mentors, um, but particularly mentees. I think just students not really knowing if we can think back to that fall of 2020, what that was gonna look like uh, for any of us, even on campus um, and virtual learning. I think students just had too many other questions and concerns to really commit to a mentoring program. So that was a very small uh, year for us. We had, uh, I believe we had six or seven mentors that we started with um, and, and uh, a few mentees who actually didn't end up staying with the program. So. Um, we learned a lot in that uh, COVID year of 20, 2021, um, but we had a really strong and committed cohort of mentors that we shifted our curriculum to really be focused on um, leadership um, for our students uh, and for um, those from marginalized identities. And we've been able to incorporate that into the program moving forward. So it was a valuable year, but it was also a very lean year in terms of sort of the year before and the a number of students we saw in the program. And then this year, you know, we've returned again to a larger a cohort and some of the things that we were able to implement in the past. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that moving forward, but this year um, we were able to do a one day retreat. At the beginning of the semester, we went out up to the um, CSU Mountain Campus. Um, we incorporated some pre-training, which was a big, um, I think a big addition. We saw a lot of progress, I think in terms of our mentors coming in, feeling more prepared um, to mentor during the academic year with a um, mentor training that, that took place before classes started. Um, and then we returned again with the uh, um, mentoring class that meets once a week and, um, and incorporating some of those leadership components from from last year. So we'll talk a little bit more about that program, the program this year as we move forward. So a few things just to kind of bring that together um, that make our program unique compared to programs um, that we're familiar with at least so far that exist on campus. Um, we have students who are part of other mentoring programs, especially our first year students. They are often part of key 
um, communities. And um, we really see that as a great support um, in different ways for our program uh, versus the key community program. So what makes our program unique is obviously that it's within our major. So only students in our major are able to participate. We ask students to commit for the full year um, and that they you know, do this voluntarily, obviously. Um, also, it's a one-to-one -one peer mentoring structure or format um, model where um, one mentor is partnered with one mentee and they are uh, a group that stays together, that, that a pair stays together through the academic year um, and uh, within the larger mentoring program community as well. I mentioned the advising and faculty partnership. This is really important with our program um, so that the program is able to stay in our department. This, this really came out of the departmental action team. Um, sometimes what we see happen on campus is that a program might get started, but then it will leave when staff changes happen. So it was really important for us to have um, this rooted in our department's structure. Um, and again, that's with an advisor and a faculty member. Um, and that it's really based on shared identities. And so um, mentors and mentees who identify as first generation students, as well as or um, as racially, ethnically diverse students. So I think I'm gonna transition over now to have Lucy come back and talk a little bit about the components of our peer mentoring program today, some of the things that have been part of our program from the beginning and some things that have been added. Yeah, and before I, um... Uh, dive into components. There were a couple of really great questions that have come through the chat. And so um, I know for myself, it's always a little hard to listen and read the chat all at the same time. So um, I just want to um, maybe bring up some of those questions. Oh, great. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so uh, we've talked a lot about the class, um, but maybe a little bit more um, detail on how many credits and whether those are lower division or upper division. Katie, do you want to um, maybe expand on that a little bit? Sure. Um, so the class currently is one credit each semester. So um, mentees receive credit for a 100 level class. They take the class together. Um, so this semester, for example, it's Wednesdays from 4 to 540. Um, mentors and mentees uh, register for the one credit class. And for mentees, it's a 100 level course. And for mentors, it's a 300 level course. Um, but it's a, a course that they take together. Awesome. There's also another question in the chat about who runs the program. And I think this is such an interesting <laughs> question because this, um, this is definitely a collaborative effort um, within our department. And so Katie, do you wanna maybe um, share a little bit more about maybe the coordination and then the teaching and what that looks like? Sure, and feel free to jump in too, Lucy. Yeah. Um, so Lucy, um, yeah, we, we do this very much together, which is, I'm sure we'll continue with the rest of the presentation where we'll add into each other's comments as well. And feel free, Lucy, to do that as I'm talking if I miss something. Um, so initially, um, myself and another, and a faculty member in HDFS, um, along with our faculty and department had obviously um, implemented the program. And so then with the um, idea of having a faculty and advisor and having this implemented in our department, it became part of our structure where it would be a faculty member um, where their part of the program is part of their service um, and just typically teaching faculty in our department. And then for Lucy, um, when we were hiring for that position, this became part of her program responsibilities. All of the advisors in our major um, oversees different programs. So this was really rooted in Lucy's job description. And then um, I oversee the program. But really what happens is we all love the program and we can't really, um, the idea was that we would sort of rotate also with different topics. Um, we are still finding our way through that because we just, we enjoy it. And, and then we connect with the students and, um, you know, we're all just really invested in that. So it's something that we're still working out, um, but 
but that's the model. So on a typical class, so for example, we'll have class tomorrow. Um, Lucy and I will be at class tomorrow and the faculty member who's part of our program um, won't be there because we're, we're you know, doing some different activities. And then we kind of rotate that, but the three of us really work on the syllabus together. Um, we work on lesson planning and those types of things. And often we're together at, um, for classes, but we do rotate just given the responsibilities and time commitments in other areas. So I don't know, Lucy, would you add anything else to that? No, I think it's, you know, I think some, I, I, I so we definitely team teach the course, um, myself, Katie, and our faculty member. Um, and, uh, you know, we kind of leverage each other's strengths in terms of topics or knowledge base or interest um, as we're kind of um, facilitating class. Our syllabus is a very collaborative process where we're all kind of adding into what the class is going to look like. Um, I would say that more of the like the program administration pieces. So when we think about um, recruitment or information sessions, um, you know, I think um, more of that. I, I kind of do more of those pieces. Um, Lucy but, does all of those pieces. Actually, she's just being, um, yeah. And I think you know, as much as we want to. Yeah, and that's really was that's part of Lucy's role, really, as the coordinator of the program. I mean, that's her that's her title in the in the coordinating of or in her um, advising responsibilities. And so she definitely does all of those things. And then we provide support or ideas or, you know, we help here and there. But that really is driven by Lucy and she does an amazing job with that. So, yeah, I also want to say we have a graduate assistant um, mm -hmm. from our department. They're typically a master's, um, a master's degree su seeking student in um, uh, in the HDFS department. And we've been really fortunate to have some um, G graduate assistant support as well um, that helps with some of the administration of the program pieces as well. So that's been a huge, that's been a huge help. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So it's very much a collaborative effort. I don't know, and I don't know that it would, I think it's that may, that's part of what, again, makes our program really special and unique that the students are having touch points with various um, different folks within our department um, and building connection um, with faculty and various staff, um, all who share um, identities that they hold, so. Yeah. So I'm also just kind of looking at time, Lucy, and I know there's some really great components that you want to talk through here. So I, if, if we can, I'm going to continue to have us move along and then make sure that we do allow um, yeah, yeah. time throughout for questions. Um, but if you want to just talk with some of the current, talk about some of the current components yeah. um, of the program. Yeah, so this is a really great visual. There's a lot of different components of our program. I think some, and we're gonna talk in detail about some of these in the next few slides. Um, but a couple of the pieces that I think are really um, important to highlight, uh, definitely the retreat that we have um, at the beginning of the semester. Um, and you'll be able to hear from um, some of our mentors and mentees about what that experience has been like for them. Um, but I. You know, pre-COVID, we were able to do an, an overnight retreat, and that was just amazing um, for students to be able to be with each other in a really um, concentrated way um, and uh, to just engage in conversation that they might not otherwise. It, we definitely kind of designed it with some intentional community building. Um, we were able to engage in a ropes course where they were able to take risks and support each other, and so it was it was great. Um, this um, during COVID, we obviously couldn't do our overnight retreat or any kind of retreat. And then this fall, we were able to do um, a half day retreat where we took our group up to Mountain Campus and um, their fabulous team um, uh, facilitated ropes course and community building for us. Um, so the retreat is definitely something that provides like a like a jump start to the relationship building um, between mentors and mentees. Um, we'll talk about recruiting here in a couple of slides. The training was also a new addition um, this fall. Um, I think we had, yeah, I think we were we were 
not certain if we wanted to ask students to come to campus prior to the semester beginning for training because students have so much going on during that time, right? I think that um, they're, you know, settling into housing situations or they might be involved in other roles on campus that also require training. Um, and so I think what we've realized is that over time, that week before the fall semester begins is ends up being really busy for students in a lot of different ways. Um, but we had consistently heard that there were some topics that mentors felt like they would really appreciate getting training on prior to engaging in those first mentoring relationships. Um, and so we did a two day, um, uh, two day training in collaboration with our peer advisors as well. Um, and we just focused on specific topics that we knew were critical in those first interactions they were gonna be having um, with their with their mentee. And so some of those topics were like, what is mentoring and what is the model of mentoring that we utilize? Title IX um, uh, reporting came in and did some uh, mandatory reporting training for us. Um, thinking about um, what the experiences of their students are gonna be within the first four weeks and um, how to normalize some of those experiences and how to provide support when needed. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about the syllabus and what we typically include in there. Uh, mentoring logs is definitely something that is part is, of this as well. Uh, you know, we have the dedicated time that we're meeting in class, uh, but then we also do want to make sure that mentors and mentees are connecting outside of that dedicated time. And so there's a log that folks submit. Um, the RAM cache is also another great um, uh, part of our program. Um, our mentors get RAM cash cards every semester um, preloaded with, um, I think it's $25 or $30 or something like that. And that really allows our mentors to go out and do some of the things that we hope that they'll be able to do to have informal um, connection with students and maybe spark some different conversations. So they've got that RAM cash, they can go grab a cup of coffee, get dinner together on campus and allow for some of that sort of natural um, uh, community relationship to start building. Um, we've incorporated some reflective writing through journals. Um, we definitely uh, do evaluations each semester. And then again, we've mentioned this many times, but um, we have collaborated not only within our department, but also thought really intentionally about who on campus um, do we also want to collaborate with. Um, so there are a couple of pieces that I thought would be really helpful if you're in here and thinking about how do I create a program like this. Um, I was just thinking about myself and some of the questions that I had when we were um, starting to really put more structure around this program. And one of the pieces I always think about is, is recruitment. Um, you know, how are we going to find students who are um, eligible and interested. And so I thought it might be helpful to just provide some perspective on how um, we do our recruitment. Um, for our mentees, uh, we're really looking at new incoming first year freshmen um, who have declared an HBFS major. Um, uh, students um, have identified as either first generation or a student of color. Um, and this is self-reported through the admissions process. So we work really closely during the summer with um, uh, RAM orientation and getting um, uh, lists of students who are coming to orientation, who identify as first gen or a student of color. Um, and so our timeline recruitment for mentees um, usually starts in May and it'll go through um, August um, when we hopefully have our cohort all together before the semester begins. Um, over the past few years, we've really uh, streamlined our like application process. And we actually this past summer moved away from calling it an application based program. Um, we thought that might actually be preventing students from um, choosing to participate if they felt like it was a competitive process or gosh, I don't know if I, you know, I don't know what this application is gonna, you know, entail. So we moved away from calling it an application and really students are submitting a short interest form if they would like to find out more about the program and potentially be paired with a mentor. After they submit an interest form, um, I will usually uh, either do a follow-up phone call or a video um, chat with the student to answer any questions they have and kind of gauge their interest in the program. 
Um, and then some of the ways that we do recruitment, again, we're, we're definitely recruiting um, for students during our RAM orientation um, interactions. Um, email, um, we've worked with our communications coordinator, who I think is in here, um, and she's created some fab fabulous um, uh, marketing materials, postcards that we actually mail out to students. Um, and then we've also done some Zoom information sessions over the past couple of summers. I just wanted to add on to that. So this has really been our approach with the Zoom, obviously with COVID. Before we did just notice that it is challenging, you know, to do this um, as opposed, be before COVID, we were in the registration rooms with students and it was just a really natural process to be able to work with a student with their registering for classes and also say like, hey, are you familiar with this program? And we would put the interest form or previously the application in with their materials. So this is definitely something that's that's had to, um, we've had to adjust with COVID. So yeah, thanks Lucy. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of mentor recruitment, again, we're, we're, mentor, we're recruiting mentors from within the HDFS major. And we also, um, our department also houses the early childhood education major. And so um, we have had a few um, students from the ECE major serve as mentors as well. Um, they need to be rising juniors or seniors, um, first generation or students of color, um, and um, at a minimum 3.0 cumulative GPA. We always say we want our students to be doing well before they're supporting others and doing well also. Um, the timeline for our mentor recruitment, we usually start around March and that will go um, through May. Um, again, there is a course component associated with this. And so we want mentors to be able to plan their fall schedules accordingly um, to accommodate the course associated with being a mentor if they're selected. Um, the process for mentors, um, they do submit an application and we ask a variety of questions around their transition to campus, um, why they want to be a mentor, um, what they think um, they can contribute to a one-on-one -on -one mentoring relationship, but also a mentoring community. Um, we also do a 30-minute interview um, and that's usually, um, we have at least two folks who are um, conducting those interviews. Um, sometimes it'll be two professional staff members or a professional staff member and a current mentor. Um, and then towards the end of the spring semester, once we've got our cohort of mentors um, put together, uh, we've had a mentor mixer where they, they're able to meet each other and start giving some feedback around what they are looking forward to and what are some areas um, that they might need more training and support in so that that can be incorporated into the fall training. Um, in terms of how we get the word out about becoming a mentor, um, we tap into our former mentees. Um, that's a really great group of folks for us to um, uh, ask if they're ready to become a mentor. And we've actually this past fall, fall of 2019, Fall 2020 um, was the first year that we were able to have former mentees come back as uh, mentors. Um, and we actually have uh, uh, someone joining us today who did that same thing as well. So you'll be able to hear from her. But yeah, going back and seeing the students who had formerly benefited from the mentoring program, if they at this point in time now have an interest in becoming a mentor. Um, we host information sessions, and we also ask for nominations from HDFS faculty um, and uh, the advisors within our department, as well as current mentors. Our mentor, our mentor matching is a little bit unique. Um, this also has shifted over time. Um, we ask mentors to create an online profile and then we kind of create a lookbook. Um, we then send that lookbook out to our mentees and allow for them to look through all of the mentors that they can choose from. Uh, mentors submit information about where they're from, their concentrations, their career interests, um, what they like to do in their free time. Um, we asked some COVID specific questions about what was challenging for folks about COVID? What did they learn about themselves through COVID? Um, and uh, mentees are able to look through all of the mentors that they can choose from. They then get to submit preferences for three mentors that they would like to be paired with. 
Um, and so um, mentees play a really critical role in that pairing process. I think um, historically there hasn't been a whole lot of um, uh, mentee input in, in mentor mentee pairings. Um, for us, it's worked out really well. Um, I'm always surprised. I, I, I always get a little bit nervous. I'm like, oh, what if the same mentee requests like, you know, like what if half of our mentees request the same mentor, you know, what will I do? Um, but um, it's actually pretty interesting, you know, students, there hasn't been a lot of um, uh, issue with that. I think students um, have very unique um, needs and wants in terms of mentorship. Um, and um, uh, and it, it kind of shows that our mentors are able to provide that. So um, there's a, there's a question in the chat about going back to the mentor recruitment slide. Um, but this definitely allows for mentees to start um, demonstrating a level of commitment um, very early on in the process and feeling like they're having agency in this um, mentoring relationship. Let's see, should I, does somebody want me to go back to the mentor slide real quick? I can't see the chat, so I just need some help. Yeah, there is a question if we can go back to that. To the mentor, is that right? Yeah, was there, was there a question about this? I don't see anything in the general chat, um, but if somebody direct messaged you, um, I can't see that as well. But okay. overall, I don't see it in the general chat. Okay, okay. we'll keep going. If somebody has a question, yeah. we'll hopefully have some time at the end. Great. Um, so our syllabus is very dynamic and organic and it definitely, um, you know, kind of, I feel like we learn something new every year um, in terms of topics that we want to stick with or topics that we want to incorporate in. Um, and so what, what I've got here are the things that have stuck over time, right? Like, I think we always want to allow for ourselves to be flexible um, and meet the needs of our students as they change over time. Um, but these are some of the topics that um, we think are really critical to achieving the goals that we're trying to achieve and, and for students to have a really um, successful transition to campus. Um, and so these are topics that just over time, and I think um, we hope to continue to incorporate in the syllabus um, each year. Um, we definitely include uh, some conversation around growth mindset and cultural capital. Um, so thinking about the identities that they hold um, and what value does that bring um, to their experience um, as a student um, on our campus, our leadership development and communication. Um, we, we include a variety of panels, um, including faculty panels, um, uh, representative of uh, first generation faculty within our department and faculty of color within our department, um, community leaders, um, former mentors and mentees. Uh, COVID really allowed us to do some cool things um, with our panels. We were able to kind of broaden our scope and um, connect with alumni of the program who are living outside of the state um, or really interesting folks with first-gen um, marginalized identities who are doing fabulous like DEI work in corporate America. Uh, and they were able to come in and kind of talk with our students, um, which may not have been able to happen if there was uh, travel expenses associated. So, um, <laughs> so uh, it really allowed us to do some neat things um, that I don't know that we otherwise would have been able to do. Um, we incorporate a couple of scavenger hunts um, to acclimate students to our campus, but also um, to get them acclimated with Fort Collins. And so this um, past, yeah, this semester, yeah, a few weeks ago, we did an, uh, a, a scavenger hunt in Fort Collins and incorporated some of the things around, you know, um, finding um, uh, some um, identity-based, um, places that they might be interested in becoming connected with. Financial aid, building systems of support. And then some of the assignments and activities, um, we do have our mentors lead um, community builders throughout the semester to um, support their own um, leadership um, and facilitation development. Um, so development of some skills that they'll be able to transfer into their careers and professional lives. 
Um, so each, um, I think it's every four weeks or so, we've got mentors leading um, community building activities, um, incorporation of reflective writings, and we provide poems based on the topics that we're kind of covering, um, participation in campus activities, we create vision boards. Um, and typically at the end of the year, we have mentors and mentees um, uh, write letters to their former selves. I would also just add, you know, the evaluations from our program evaluations have really helped inform the topics too, because students will say to us, you know, even as we're working on the spring schedule right now or the spring syllabus, we'll ask students you know, for their feedback, and then we'll make those adjustments, you know, where we can or where it makes sense. Um, so it really is, like Lucy said, it really is collaborative and it's, it's a fun process. Um, we've had the opportunity to collaborate with a lot of different folks um, throughout the years. Um, we, we have a really strong collaboration with um, the College of Health and Human Sciences Career Services staff. Um, Kara Johnson is a career educator over um, in the College of Health and Human Sciences, and she has done um, some fabulous um, work with us and our group in terms of strengths assessments, um, career development, um, uh, she's amazing and we've utilized her in a lot of different ways. Um, most recently, we um, had financial aid come in um, and talk about um, the FAFSA and um, the CSUSA. Um, we collaborate with um, first gen faculty and faculty of color within our department. Um, we also um, have the CSU Health Network join us once um, a semester to uh, present on um, uh, mental, physical, or emotional um, health related um, topics. So uh, again, we kind of think about what, what our student needs and are there folks on campus who are already expert in this area? Um, and how can we bring them into our space to be able to have students feel comfortable going into their spaces or connecting with a person rather than um, an office. I think oftentimes we'll encourage students to go over to the CSU Health Network or go visit financial aid, but it can be really intimidating and overwhelming if you don't know a person in that space. Um, so I think allowing folks, to, inviting folks to join us in our space and having our students meet them um, in our class and through our program, um, then allows your students to feel comfortable connecting with them outside of our program. Um, obviously, we also assess kind of our, our, our progress towards our goals. And there's a couple of different ways that we do our assessments. Um, we have mentors and mentees um, complete a pre-semester and an end of semester survey each fall and spring. Um, and through those evaluations, through those surveys, we're evaluating their connectedness to our department, connectedness to campus. We're also looking at some things related to the mentoring relationship. So satisfaction with the relationship, comfort level. Um, for our mentors, we um, kind of gauge their confidence in the mentoring role to see how that changes and shifts over time. Um, for our first year students, we do ask a few questions to help us get a sense of their confidence or comfort level in navigating campus. And then we also ask about areas of training or support that they may need. And this also helps inform um, some of the topics um, that we incorporate into the class um, or some of the writings that we ask folks to do. Um, and then a couple of other things that we look at as well. Um, that are outside of the surveys are um, academic performance um, and then um, retention as well. So, um, you know, just real quick, uh, some of the things that we've already highlighted here um, to share some of the successes of our program and some of the challenges that we faced. So I think just you know, I, I, I was really nervous uh, last year. Like, you know, there were times when we just talked about, should we continue this program? Um, because it was really challenging. And without mentees, we really were, <laughs> of course, somebody decided to do weed whacking outside my window um, during our presentation. So sorry about that, if you can hear it. But um, we were really nervous. I mean, how do we, we hadn't done this before, right? How do we do a program when half of the people 
we need to be part of the program aren't, aren't present. Um, so the fact that we've been able to weather that year, I think we're just, you know, I'm just really grateful and I'm just, uh, you know, I think it's a big tribute to Lucy because of the work that she did with um, outreach with our mentors. And then I think it's also a big tribute to our mentors because they were part of the reason that we weren't going to, you know, um, consider not moving forward. They just were committed. They were insightful. And, you know, we were meeting with a group of six. There were three, you know, administrators and six students and it's still, you know, we really helped each other, I think, through that year. Um, like Lucy mentioned, our, you know, seeing some of our former mentees now apply to be mentors and have this cycle start to be established. Um, we see relationship building, uh, of course, with mentors and mentees, but then also we'll see mentoring pairs who will, you know, make really um, great connections with each other. So a pair of four might go do something um, or, you know, make dinner together or go to coffee or whatever. Um, mentors expanding their um, connection to our major as well by making, um, building relationships with other mentors. The same with our mentees, with their um, other first year students. And then the overall mentoring community, even though a student might have, or a mentor might be a mentee, a student might be a mentor to a mentee, that student mentor might also make a connection with another mentee. And so it's not super rigid where those other you know, relationships aren't fluid. We um, talked about the support from our department. This has been really huge in terms of um, uh, support through leadership changes. So we have a new department head um, last year. She's incredibly supportive. We have support from the college. Um, and again, seeing that through graduate assistant um, and other um, financial supports that we get as well. Um, and then some of the challenges, you know, I think um, we mentioned just right now, it's really exclusive to first year students. And we realize that that's a limited uh, number of students. And so looking at how can we expand this support to other students? Um, and then this balance between academic content, but it's not an academic course and really wanting to engage the student experience, which is why we moved to an hour and 40 minute session so that we were trying to create this environment where students could have meaningful conversations with their mentors and mentees with one another um, within the context of our class and not having to have that commitment extend outside of the class period. Um, and then of course, COVID. Um, and the program momentum and those types of things. So some of the challenges and successes, but, but we feel like we're kind of back on track and looking forward. Um, some key components of the program, again, have been departmental buy-in, the financial support uh, helping us that first year. And then like Lucy said, not needing that amount of money to maintain a program, but being able to get financial support from our department has been helpful. Um, the embedded structure in our major with full-time faculty and advising commitments, the grad assistant funding, and then academic. The academic course has been significant. Um, students get credit. You know, we're looking at potentially increasing that credit. It counts towards their overall graduation credits. It counts towards our, some of our concentrations. Um, so really helping um, expand the scope of participation in the program and the benefits of doing so. So I rushed through that a little bit because I'm looking at time and I think more than hearing from us at this point, you probably would really like to hear from our students. So um, I'm gonna have uh, Lucy kind of introduce the panel and they will introduce themselves and we have some questions to help uh, structure this conversation. Awesome. Yeah, so we've got three. We are so fortunate. It's a busy time of year for everyone, but especially for our students. And so we're really grateful that we have three um, students joining us today. These are all folks who are currently um, participating in our mentoring program. Um, and two out of the three actually have been with us um, previously as well in different roles. So um, I'm going to allow for you all to introduce yourselves um, and then we'll get started with uh, maybe asking um, one or two questions, but I also want to make sure that folks um, who are joining us are able to ask questions as well. Um, so, um, Jesse, would you mind introducing yourself first? Yeah, sure thing. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jesse Chirosky. I am a first or a 
third year <laughs> student. Um, I am studying HDFS with a concentration in entrepreneurship and leadership, which coincides with this um, program. My preferred pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and I actually was a former mentee in 2019 and 2020. Um, and now I am a mentor in the program this year. So I'm very excited for um, this panel and um, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Jesse. Um, Jaslyn, would you like to go next? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Jesse. Um, but my name is Jaslyn Pacheco. Um, uh, pronouns she, her, ella. Um, my major is also HCFS with a concentration in leadership and entrepreneur. Um, I am currently a fourth year um, and I am a returning mentor from last year. So Jocelyn was with us during our strange COVID year, and I was so excited that she was like, yeah, I'm coming back. I was like, thank goodness. Um, and Jocelyn's um, mentee is joining us today as well. So Perla, would you, um, would you be able to introduce yourself? Yes. First of all, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. My name is Perla Lerma. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a HDFS major with a concentration in pre-health. I am a current first year and my role in the mentoring program is being a mentee, so. Awesome. Um, so Perla, I'm actually gonna ask, well, Perla and Jesse, this question is for you too, I guess, um, uh, to start off, but I would love for you all to be able to share a little bit about how your experience as a mentee in the program impacted um, your transition to campus. Um, I can go. Um, so without this program, um, I have a feeling I wouldn't have stayed here at CSU or attended college. Um, it really, it guided me in a sense where they provided me resources and um, connections to the advising staff, which was really, really incredible in my transition into, onto campus. Um, I made a lot of friends, which was incredible. Um, so it really, it kind of just encouraged me to keep going. And with those resources, I mean, with financial aid and um, like the writing center and tilt, it was really, really beneficial and actually learning how those programs work and having a friend or a mentor um, kind of helped me through that transition. And so, yeah, this program was really, really, really impactful in my transition. And um, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm really grateful to be a part of it. So that's, yeah. <laughs> um, similar to Jesse, um, this program has been really helpful in my transition. Um, it just helped, has helped me have that space um, where I have students that also have similar identities as myself, such as like being a student of color and a first generation. Um, and it's just, it's been really helpful to have that support network and having that space where I can um, just be myself and um, have other peers that identify like me, so. Um. I also, I think this one I would like for Jesse and um, uh, uh, for Jocelyn and Jesse, um, but I'm, I'm really interested in finding out how your role as a mentor um, has impacted your own kind of leadership development and your um, kind of connectedness to our department. And um, you can share a little bit about that. I can go again. Um, so yeah, as a mentor, or just being a leader in general, you know, you, you, you think, I think, and just like leader, um, you're helping someone, you're guiding someone, um, but you're kind of like the, the big sister, big brother type kind of person. Um, but kind of learning about like what it really means to be a mentor. I mean, I learned that it's like, it's a friendship and, you know, you're both equal parts in the, the mentorship or the program. Um, and so kind of learning that kind of, outlook on what it means to be a leader is really interesting um because it's not like a dictatorship it's more yeah it's a partnership so you guys are learning from each other um yes as a mentor you may know a little bit more information um but then again like your mentee may ask a question where you're like oh my gosh wow i didn't even know that so um it's more of like a partnership um 
within that leadership role. Um, and yeah, and then that kind of goes into, since I am in a leadership major or concentration, it's been, it helps a lot kind of guide what I want to do in my future and how I want to, um, be a leader, leader towards other people, um, you know, and, and other programs or, you know, my future roles. So, um, it's been really, really interesting kind of learning from my mentee and for myself of how I can kind of guide them. Um, so yeah, it's been kind of nice. Yeah, so um, similar to Jesse, I feel like um, it just creates a big bond of sort of um, partnership and not only like you providing your mentee with extra support, but them also providing you with extra support and like developing different leadership skills that you like didn't know you had within you. Um, I definitely think that uh, my leadership development has grown a lot and basically being that support system for somebody else um and like for myself like being a first generation student I can mentor my mentee and like oh like I recommend you doing this and um just providing a lot of helpful tips that I wish I would have done my first year or that I wish I knew so a lot of um yeah a lot of leadership development um not only within the leadership role but also uh, moving forward as I excel in my career so I want to make sure that folks in the room are able to ask some questions of our panels um so if if there are participants um, who are joining us who have burning questions that you'd like to ask our panelists um Feel free to feel free to just to speak up. Yeah, and if folks want to raise their hand, you know, we can we can look, you know, make sure we can catch you that way as well. Um, it looks like Brittany, you have a question. Um, yeah, I guess my question is from like mentors and mentees. Do you wish that this was like a required step? <laughs> as a first generation, um, like being a part of a program like this? That's a really good question. Um, I think I think the way that um, Katie and Lucy kind of pick us <laughs> um, is actually really, really awesome. I don't I wouldn't say it should be required, although I wish um, more people participated only because this program um, I don't know. It's so amazing because it guides you in a way where like you, you, you act as though you know what you're doing in college. So when, I mean, cause when you're first generation student, you have no idea what you're doing. You don't know what it's like to be a student or how to navigate certain things on campus. And so this program initially gives you that boost and confidence to kind of navigate, navigate college. So I really, I really hope that this program has a greater voice on campus um, and will influence more and more students who are a person of color or a first generation student to participate, but I wouldn't say necessarily require it, although it would be nice, you know, to, to have more people kind of be involved in it for sure. It makes a huge difference. I can add a little bit more to that as well. Um, yeah, I would say that this program is just really amazing. Um, me, myself, being in it two times already or like last year and this year, I definitely feel like I've grown tremendously um, in the leadership aspect and like COVID with everything going on. I feel like what our mentorship um, class was focused on was definitely um, leadership um, within women and like now as a mentee I feel like I mentor I have developed a lot of leadership skills with connecting with um, my faculty and staff um, with my advisors and just different um, professors that before I feel like I would never get that confidence to just be really involved within my major um, and with my faculty and now I feel like um, you know like they're my friends and they're um, just big leaders that I look up to and I feel like this is like something that a lot of departments should encourage um, just because it creates a lot of um, that really I feel like involvement within your major um, and yeah 
There was a question in the chat about how you all found out about the program. Yeah, I actually have a fun little story about that. So um, when I was applying for CSU, um, I had gotten an email from, I think, Katie, um, just saying like, this is a program that you might be interested in. I ignored all of those <laughs> emails um, until registration and orientation where Katie pulled me aside and was like, hey, um, you know, I really just want to explain to you what this program is about. And I think you'd, uh, you know, really you know, grow from it and everything. And I was like, okay, I'll think about it. And then the next day or that night I applied for it. Um, and I don't regret that decision one bit. I'm really glad that she, you know, kind of, I mean, she saw like growth in me. And so she was like, I encourage you to take this opportunity. Um, and it was, I don't know, it was really nice having that like one-on-one -on -one connection with her. Um, and also just like recruitment in general. Um, I know Lucy stepped out this year to kind of find other students uh, during RAM orientation and everything and RAM welcome. Um, and so, yeah, it's really encouraging for them to really choose a student that they know will, you know, take it or have an impact on this program. So, yeah. Um, I also got an email and right away I just knew I had to apply um, just because in high school I was part of a um, college prep program and they were focused on first gen students and students of color and they were just super supportive. And I knew I going into college, I needed that support network um, once again. So um, like Jesse said, I don't regret the decision one bit. Um, this program has been super helpful. So, yeah. I wonder, you know, I'm just looking at time and our, our goal was really to uh, we want to share the program and we really would love to open this conversation up across campus because we know there's other programs happening or there could be other their interest in having other programs and again not not reinventing the wheel and so um, we're we have to cut short I think a couple other parts of our presentation but I wondered if if maybe it would be helpful for folks um, and Lucy feel free to say no let's do this just I'm just uh, I'm just uh spitballing here a little bit, but um, I think it might be helpful for the mentees and um, Jesse as a mentee, excuse me, and Perla, but then Jaslyn as a mentor and Jesse as a current mentor to share maybe a little bit about what that one-to-one, -one, like what are some things you do? What are things you like about class? And again, you know, we, we are a little short on time, but it seems like that would be somewhat helpful if, if you don't mind. But Lucy, what are your thoughts there? I think that sounds great. We've talked a lot about how we've designed the program, and I think it's really great to hear from students about what they benefit from it. <laughs> yeah, I can add on. Um, I know that they mentioned a lot about the retreat, which is one of my <laughs> one of my favorite activities that we do in this program. Um, the reason being is because it is a one on one experience with your mentee and mentor, but it also is a community builder. Um, I know like as a mentee, I made so many friends my mentor at the time couldn't attend to that retreat. And so I um, got the opportunity to meet another mentor and a mentee. Um, and we got along really well. And I basically had two mentors towards the end of the session, which was really incredible. Um, but yeah, the one on one mentoring experiences are super, super incredible. Um, you kind of form a relationship with your mentor or mentee um, in a sense that you can always rely on them. So it's another friend that you have that you can talk to or ask questions to um, no matter what position you're in in that uh, role. And uh, it's really empowering too because um, it, it's already it's almost an automatic bond bonding session for you guys and it's I don't know it's really really cool to kind of um, share that with someone who sh shares the same identities or similar identities to you um, and be in that culture um, and community, so. So Jesse, J Jocelyn and Perla are, are current, like, like they're a mentor mentee pair. And so I, I, I just kind of echoing off what Katie said, I would love for y'all to kind of share like what has the first 10 weeks of the semester looked like for you all as you've um, kind of formed and grown your mentoring relationship? Uh, 
Okay, yeah, I can start off. Um, yeah, so um, it definitely was a big change, just like I mentioned. Um, last year, it was just a lot of um, self-development, just focusing on that. And this year um, that I did go get paired up um, with my mentee, Perla, um, it was definitely... I don't, I feel like automatic, well, at least for me, automatically, I definitely felt um, that bond with someone that I, you know, who shared the same identities as me and was interested in the same uh, major as us, as I was, and um, just like a lot of connecting of how our first years was, what we wish we would have done, um, and just like a lot of like, what we see ourselves doing in the future. Um, so I, I don't know, I just like really enjoy it to have someone who like shares different interests as me. Um, it's just like really great to have that space to bond and share with someone. Um, and yeah, someone to give advice to um, is always great. Um, just like Jasmine was saying, um, I think it was like an automatic connection, which was like super nice um, and super like comforting, just knowing that um, I was able to connect really well with her. And now I know I have someone to count on and like rely on, like if I need help or if I have any questions, concerns, and I know I can just approach her and she can um, help me um, with anything. Um, so that's been really helpful and I just think Jaslyn is great like she's super sweet and super supportive so I'm so glad she um, is part of my support network now um, but yeah it's definitely um, really great because I think our relationship I think it goes beyond like a mentor-mentee relationship I think now we form like a friendship um, which is really nice too so I just want to add, Perla, can I share what you shared with me the other day about the texts that Jocelyn sends every once in a while? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, like Jocelyn would, would like randomly text me saying like, I hope you have a good day, which like um, really helps me like and mo motivates me, I guess. Um, and she's just super sweet. <laughs> so really nice of her to just have like gestures like that. <laughs> yeah, and I think we encourage our mentors and mentees to get out across campus and engage um, in events and activities. Um, but it's also, it can be the smallest things um, that have the biggest impact um, on that mentoring relationship. Um, just, you know, good luck on that exam, or how did that first paper go, or have a great day um, when it's week nine and we are feeling like this is gonna be a, you know, a difficult uh, journey for the rest of the semester. Some of those things are so um, just simple and easy to do and just have such a significant experience on that transition to campus for students. So um, we had some, you know, hopes of having some breakout groups and having you all kind of share your experiences. And so I'm sorry that we've had to kind of make that adjustment. Um, what we'd like to do is be able to ask you all to share with us um, either in the chat or afterwards. Um, you know, uh, Danny, I don't know, can they, re if they wanna share um, interest in connecting after today, can they do that? Mm -hmm. Is there another way through the diversity symposium that they can do that or would they just contact us directly? Yeah, it would probably be best to contact you directly. Okay. Um, yeah, because there's not a no point throughout the rest of the diversity symposium where we're gonna have like a- Sure. That would be a good idea though, to have like presenters and then like attendees attend and do like a networking mixer type thing. That'd be great, um, but we don't have that. <laughs> Okay, so you know, like I said, the other in, the other um, intention for this session was that we could connect with other people on campus to share resources, stories, um, and potentially even trainings. You know, if we're all doing training of leadership, then potentially we could do it with those of you who are doing peer mentoring programs in your departments or through cultural centers. Um, and so, 
um, I believe we'll have access to the registration or to the people who attended today. Um, and you know, you you are welcome to email us. Lucy, would you mind just putting our emails in the chat as well? Um, because this next, you know, the next step is really that, like how can we share our resources with, uh, with each other across campus? Um, instead of kind of having these siloed um, experiences for students that we might be able to, you know, kind of stretch across that and stretch across campus to collaborate and, um, and, and develop some type of coalition where we maybe meet once a semester or, you know, have a conversation about what that might look like. So um, we really appreciate you coming. Um, there's an evaluation. I'm sure we're going to get evaluated that we ran over <laughs> and had to cut some things short. So we'll, we are learning through this process too. Um, but if you would please share your feedback, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, and I know that um, the symposium is looking for that feedback as well. So um, like Lucy said, we just thank you all so much. We thank the students for your time um, and your willingness to share your experiences and for all of you who attended. And we really do hope that, um, that we hear from you and we look forward to potentially collaborating with you um, in the future. So Danny and Kyle, thanks so much for moderating. Um, Lucy, is there anything else that you would like to share or to, to comment about before we wrap up? No, I just appreciate folks uh, joining us. And, and again, I just wanna echo, we, we're hoping that this is a starting point for maybe future conversations around, um, you know, um, uh, collaborating around mentoring across campus.